Hello everyone, it's Dr. Juwan. Thank you for turning in. If you haven't done so already, four things. Subscribe button, hit the like, the bell notification, and if you need to or want to, leave a comment down below. We had a viewer write in and they were asked about atrial fibrillation. And, all right, all right, all right, how you doing? Hey, what's going what's on, man? What's going on? How's it going out there in, in TV land or computer land? Well, I was saying that we had uh, one of our viewers asked if we could do atrial fibrillation and natural treatments. So I figured this, if it's okay with them, that I will do the conditions of atrial fibrillation, what it is, and then I'll pass it on to you and say, have you do the, the after stuff, the home care stuff? Because atrial fibrillation is not really easy to understand. However, the treatment protocol, there's a lot of things that our viewers could do which will help prevent the likelihood of them having atrial fibrillation. Okay, so you're gonna do the condition of atrial fibrillation, and then you want me to go over the electrolytes, the supplements, and other things that you could do to help yourself if you have this. Okay, sounds good. All right, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Thank you very much, and enjoy. Okay. Thank you. Sounds like a great plan. Okay, then he'll take part one and I'll take part two and hope you enjoyed the video and be good. Thank you. So what is atrial fibrillation or commonly known as AFib? And there are four different types of irregular heartbeats. Atrial fibrillation is the most common type. Now AFib, really what it is, it's an abnormal heart rhythm. It is electric, it's an electrical problem of the heart because the heart our bodies are electrical beings, and we do have the electrical conductivity through the heart, which tells each chamber to pump accordingly. And what happens is that the atrium, which is the top portions of the heart, they quiver instead of contract. They don't contract, they quiver. They do like a little dance instead of contract. So what also that causes abnormal pulling of the blood and people who have AFib increase their risk of a stroke because the contractibility is not rhythmic. There's four different types of arrhythmias, which is a regular heartbeat, cardiac arrhythmia, atrial fibrillation. And what happens because due to the irregular heart contractions, the blood pools, which could lead to blood clots, a stroke, dementia, heart failure, and even death. So the common question is, what are heart palpitations? You hear that a lot. What are heart palpitations and why they matter so much? Because heart palpitations is a sudden, is a sudden flutter. It's a fluttering of the heartbeat typically associated with an increased heartbeat, which is called tachycardia. Tachycardia is an increased heartbeat. Bradycardia is a lowered heartbeat. So your heart's just not bumping like like hitting on a drum, it, 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 it's, it's irregular. And those are heart palpitations. It may occur spontaneously or a result of stress, stress, anxiety, too much caffeine, cold medications, inhalers, anything that has to interfere with the conductivity of the heart rate, the heart beat. Okay, of the four types of arrhythmias, which I'm not gonna get into that, the most common type is AFib. So what is a fibrillation? atrial fibrillation. The most common type of heart arrhythmia. What is arrhythmia is just an irregular heartbeat. Now remember, it's an electrical problem of the heart. So you have the abnormal firing of electrical impulses in the upper two chambers of the heart. So the heart has four chambers. The upper two are the atriums, the, low, the bottom two are the ventricles, blood comes through the atria first, then gets shunted to the ventricles. Then when the ventricles contract, one side either goes throughout the body systemic or the other side goes to the lungs to get for the blood to get reoxygenated. So this causes the atria to be chaotically and irregularly out of coordination with the ventricles. The upper chambers start to beat too fast. The lower ventricles are like, hey, what are you doing? You're dumping too much blood in here. So I need to increase my contractibility to shunt blood out of the heart. However, with atrial fibrillation, the signals in the atria are chaotic. So what happens is that the atria will fibrillate and the heart rate will increase, an increased rate to anywhere from 100 to 175 beats per minute or even more. The impulses do not get through to the ventricles. 
So with the electrical system, it doesn't go down and affect the ventricles. So the ventricles don't beat as rapid. Okay, so what types of symptoms do you, are you experiencing with atrial fibrillation? One, palpitations. It's that irregular heartbeat. It almost feels like an anxiety. It feels like the most common description, they say it, felt, it feels like if there's a fish out of water, it's in my heart. That's the best way I can explain it because it's not beating in a very, very rhythmic fashion. Palpitations, chest pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, dizziness, lightheadedness. So believe it or not, 60% of people do not experience any symptoms of AFib whatsoever. However, the complications if you have AFib, blood clots, due to the pooling of blood. Remember, the atria are beating irregularly. The ventricles are not beating out of control because the electrical system doesn't make it down there to cause a spon you know, spontaneous firing. So you're gonna have pooling of blood, may have a stroke. And if you have AFib, it increases your chances of stroke anywhere from four times to six times. Cardiovascular disease, you may have heart failure, ischemia of heart disease, or even sudden death with AFib. Okay, so how do you diagnose AFib? There's a couple different ways to diagnose atrial fibrillation. One with an EKG or ECG. They're pretty much the same. It's like couch and sofa. Blood test. There are cardiac markers in your blood labs that will show the condition of what's going on with your heart. In addition, stress test. And most likely your doctor will give you a chest x-ray because they want to look at the lungs and the heart to the chest x-ray to see any type of cardiac abnormalities. So with the goal, if you do have it, there's a couple different things that we could work with. One, you want to have an anti-inflammatory diet. Everything is diet related because the foods that we have here are contribute to a lot of sickness, illness, illness, and disease. And your heart is a muscle, so I always say first change your diet. Regular exercise. Exercise is good for the body, it's good for the system. Getting outside and just enjoying the outside the, the earth air is phenomenal for the body as a whole. Lose excess weight. Weight has a tremendous impact on how the body operates. Stress management, especially sleep. I know that's tough to say in this world with all the stress the stressors that are going on, but definitely I try to always stress stress management. You can't control the stimulus coming at you. However, you could always control your outcome, the reaction towards it, and definitely with sleep. Balance electrolytes. Those electrolytes are they're all those little minerals and vitamins that help our bodies cope and interact with the daily stressors and also if they're imbalanced, it could cause a lot of other conditions. And supplements, definitely supplements and I'll go over that in a second. And we're going over there now, thank you. Okay, so how do you treat AFib naturally or how do you want to avoid it or just how, how do you just maintain overall good health? Remember, because we are electrical beings, this is why you could walk across a wall carpet and you could shock somebody. You can't shock yourself, but you could shock somebody else because we're electrical conducting systems, and especially the heart. The heart is a phenomenal electric pump that beats 24-7, 365. So heart health is important, and one of the ways that we can maintain it and keep it healthy is through electrolytes. And of course, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go over supplements as well. So what are these electrolytes? Electrolytes, they're nutrients that have many essential roles throughout the body, and as a result, an imbalance could result in noticeable changes very, very quickly. This is why like out on a hot day or if you're at the beach or if you're in a hot environment, you're sweating a lot. And this is why you can be, you know, you get your dizziness, fatigue, anxiety, muscle spasms. If you're dehydrated, irritability, trouble sleeping, heart palpitations, and in addition to low blood pressure. So this is why electrolytes and replenishing the electrolytes are so important just to maintain the body's homeostatic state so everything flows as normal as they could be. Because when you're on a, any type of prescription medication that you're on, it blocks the absorption of nutrients and vitamins and minerals. For every one prescription medication it creates two symptoms because of the mechanism of action. Now, when it comes to electrolytes, very, very important on maintaining how the body works. And this is in no particular order, okay? So we got potassium. Potassium is phenomenal. It stabilizes blood pressure, it regulates heart contraction, 
helps with muscle function, nerve impulses. Now with potassium comes sodium. So sodium helps maintain fluid balance, nerve signaling, blood pressure, muscle contractions. So when it comes to the sodium potassium pump, for those who understand how the body works, the dosage, we need 1500 milligrams of sodium. We need three times the amount of potassium because I always say sodium is the gas pedal, potassium is the brake. When you have too much sodium, what happens? This is where you could have increased irritability. This is where you could have increased contractibility. This is where you could have irregular firing, atrial fibrillation, because potassium is the natural braking mechanism of the body. And we need three times the amount of potassium as we do sodium. In addition, magnesium. Magnesium is a phenomenal braking system and there's 10 different types of magnesium. So make sure you do your research on which magnesium is needed for what you want to achieve. Because magnesium has over 300, is involved with over 300 enzymatic reactions throughout the body. And I've done a video on magnesium and with magnesium, it's needed for muscle contractions, proper heart rhythm, nerve functioning, bone building and strength, reduce anxiety, healthy digestion, sustaining and, uh, I'm sorry, sustaining and stable protein fluid balance. So you see that sodium is the gas pedal, potassium and magnesium are the braking mechanisms. Magnesium is a natural smooth muscle relaxant. And it's very, very important. And we need minimal 400 milligrams of magnesium a day. Now again, do your research on what you want to achieve it with. Okay, let's go to calcium. Calcium helps with muscle contraction, nerve signaling, blood clotting, cell division, forming and maintaining bones and teeth. Now, calcium, that is the initiator to how the body works afterwards. Okay, it's kind of like calcium comes into the area and starts everything up while then you have sodium, potassium, magnesium, and then a plethora of other, of other uh, neurotransmitters or other you know, sequences are, that are going throughout the system. So, so calcium is very, very important as the initiator. Chloride, I always say chloride is like you have a gang of people, gang of you know, your friends, and it's that one guy or one girl that always hangs with you. Don't really know why. She doesn't serve any very high importance, but she's always there. She completes the gang. So that's chloride. That's how I explain chloride. Because it helps maintain fluid balance, helps maintain proper blood pH, and it's needed to make stomach acid, hence hydrochloric acid. So chloride is just there kind of like to close the group, make the group complete. And we need 2,300 milligrams of chloride a day. So it comes to recommended intake. Now again, this is just recommended. Potassium, minimal is 4,700 milligrams because remember, that's the braking mechanism. Sodium, that's the gas pedal, a minimum on the average 1,500 milligrams. Magnesium, remember, do your research, 400 milligrams of magnesium is required daily at least. Calcium, 1,000 milligrams and chloride, 2,300 milligrams per day, minimal to keep the body functioning on a normal state. So then now let's go to supplements. Now there's a lot of supplements that you could take to help stabilize the heart because the heart is a muscle. So I'm just going to go over just, just what I recommend. Glutathione, master antioxidant, has a lot of good properties. 1500 milligrams, empty stomach first thing in the morning. Curcumin, minimal 500 to 2000 milligrams a day. Now there's a, there's a very big stretch there because one of curcumin, the active ingredient, turmeric, is good as an anti-inflammatory. When you're less inflamed, your body's going to run better and the dosage varies according to person. Omega-3 fatty acids, now minimal, 1,000 milligrams because I've done a video before. You have the EPA and you have the DHA. Now the DHA, that's good for eyes, and brain. The EPA is good for systemic inflammation and also too, the DHA is good for heart. CoQ10, 300 milligrams. The heart is a muscle, beats 24-7, 365. CoQ10 is needed for heart health. Now magnesium, magnesium malate. This is in the form of magnesium malate. This is, this is good for the heart. 
minimal 1500 milligrams a day. Now you can spread that out or you can take that all at once. So I hope this helps. If you like this, please leave a comment, subscribe, hit the like button, share with a friend, and we'll see you on the next video. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching.